Abigail was returning from the store when her neighbor Betty caught up with her. Hey, Abigail, the young and very talkative woman greeted cheerfully. Looks like you're loaded down again. Hi, Betty. What can I do? I don't have time to go shopping every day, so I get groceries for the whole week. It's easier that way. I don't go shopping myself. My husband handles that in our family. You're lucky, Abigail sighed. I don't have a husband, so I have to manage on my own. Listen, Abigail, do you know anything about that new guy in our building? He lives in apartment 56. Who is he? I have no idea who he is, Abigail shrugged. The owners of that apartment are always renting it out to someone. I don't keep track of who lives there. I'm just curious. I have my own worries. Why are you so interested in the new neighbor? I don't like him. He seems unpleasant. I greeted him the other day, and he looked at me like I'd just insulted him. What did I do? I just said hello. I greet all the neighbors. And he didn't greet you back? He nodded, but his look. I'll tell you, he's an unpleasant type. Maybe he's a criminal? Why label someone like that? You don't even know him, Abigail countered. I've seen him a couple of times in passing, but I didn't pay much attention. What's wrong with him? I just wanted to warn you, just in case, that there's a suspicious character in our building. And God knows what kind of friends he might start bringing over, people just like him. I feel uneasy about it. Do you have the landlord's phone number? You've lived here longer than I have. Maybe you could call her and ask who she let into the apartment? We have the right to know who we're living with in the same building and what to expect. I don't have the landlord's number. We could ask Leslie. She's the one in charge. She probably knows. Exactly. Thanks for the idea. I'll talk to her, Betty said, pleased. You know, Abigail, sometimes it's better to be overly cautious than to be caught off guard. Do you agree? Maybe, Abigail shrugged. They had just arrived at their building. They lived in a five-story building, Betty on the second floor and Abigail on the fifth. After reaching the second floor, Abigail paused to rest for a moment, her arms ached from the heavy bags. Well, see you, Abigail, Betty said, opening the door to her apartment, and then called out cheerfully, Honey, I'm home. After standing there for a few seconds, Abigail picked up the bags again and slowly began to climb the stairs. When she reached the third floor, the door to apartment 56 swung open and a man stepped out. Upon seeing Abigail, he looked at her intently, then without saying a word, took the bags from her hands and carried them up to the fifth floor. Abigail was a bit taken aback by the neighbor's behavior. She quickly made her way to her floor, where the man was waiting for her, still holding the heavy bags. Sorry, he said. You know you live on the fifth floor, but I don't know which apartment, the man continued. Here's my apartment. Abigail replied. Thank you so much. You grabbed the bags from me so quickly that I was a bit startled. I can't just walk past when I see a woman struggling with heavy things. Thanks again, Abigail said, pulling her keys from her bag. The neighbor waited for her to unlock the door, then brought in the bags, said goodbye, and left. Hi, Mom, said Abigail's nine-year-old son, Clark, as he came into the hallway. Hi, sweetheart. Did you finish your homework? Abigail asked as she headed to the kitchen with the bags. I learned the poem, but I didn't understand one math problem. I was waiting for you. I'll heat up dinner now, and we can figure out your problem afterward, Abigail smiled, unpacking the groceries. Mom, I ate all the soup at lunch. And I washed the dishes. Clark said. Good job, my little helper, Abigail praised him. 
Abigail was raising her son alone. His father had died when Clark was just two years old, and he didn't remember him at all. But he did remember his uncle Eric, his stepfather. Clark was five when his mom met Eric. The man courted her beautifully, and after three months of dating, he proposed, which Abigail accepted after some thought. It couldn't be said that Abigail was deeply in love with him. She didn't have the intense feelings for Eric that she once had for Clark's father. But she didn't expect to love anyone like she had loved Clark's dad. Eric seemed reliable, and Abigail, tired of being alone, decided she shouldn't turn down his proposal. Her mother and sister also encouraged her. This is a good option. Don't be foolish, Abigail, her older sister Paula said. It's hard to raise a child on a small salary alone. Accept it, think about it, there's no great love here. He's not repulsive, he's a decent looking man. Plus, Clark needs a father, right? The most important thing is that he's not put off by your son, their mother supported Paula. Not every man is willing to marry a woman with a child. Consider yourself lucky. Plus, Eric has no bad habits and earns well. What more do you need for a good life? Abigail didn't feel particularly lucky. Living tightly with someone she didn't love didn't seem like a great idea. But her sister and mother managed to convince her that turning down Eric's proposal would be very unwise, and Abigail eventually agreed. They didn't have a traditional wedding. They just signed the papers and celebrated the occasion with a family dinner. However, soon after, Abigail deeply regretted listening to her mother and Paula. Not only was Eric stingy, demanding an account for every penny spent, making her show receipts from the store, and heavily restricting her expenses, but he also constantly reminded her that he had taken her on with a child, and she should be very grateful for that. He considered little Clark spoiled and pampered and decided to take it upon himself to raise his stepson. I'll make a real man out of him, Eric declared. Your feminine upbringing has completely ruined him, Eric would angrily say. Abigail and Eric had completely different views on parenting. One day, when she came home, she found Clark crying in the corner after being punished by Uncle Eric. Abigail was horrified. But she was even more horrified to learn that, in her absence, Eric had been hitting the boy with a belt. In his opinion, you couldn't raise a real man without it. Abigail couldn't tolerate such behavior. She ordered Eric to leave her apartment immediately and filed for divorce. You're a fool, the man said, packing his things. Who will want you? I was just trying to help. My dad used to whip me when I was a kid. He beat the foolishness out of me, and that's why I grew up to be a decent man. Your Clark will turn into a wimp. A decent man wouldn't raise a hand to a child, Abigail replied, feeling both anger toward Eric and relief at the same time. Recently, she had been increasingly burdened by the marriage, realizing she had made a huge mistake in marrying this man. After the divorce, Abigail decided she wouldn't marry again. The thought of someone else trying to raise her son was unbearable. She also didn't want to be reminded that she had come with a child. No, she had had enough of Eric. She and Clark would manage on their own. No one else was needed. The next day, Abigail ran into Betty on the street again. Betty had found out the number of the landlord of the apartment where the suspicious guy lived, in her opinion. I'll call this Rachel today. She needs to explain who she let into that apartment, Betty declared determinedly. I think you're being too negative about this person, Abigail said. Did you see his scars? He was clearly involved in some kind of altercation, probably a stabbing. Why immediately jump to conclusions? Maybe he was in an accident. By the way, he helped me carry my bags to my apartment yesterday. He said he couldn't just stand by and watch a woman struggle with heavy things. 
I hope you didn't let him into your home. I did. What's wrong with that? Abigail shrugged. He helped me with the bags, brought them inside, said goodbye, and left. As you can see, he didn't do anything bad to me. Abigail, are you out of your mind? Her neighbor exclaimed. Why would you let him in? He's probably scoped out your living situation to see if there's anything to steal. Come on, Betty, what are you saying? First of all, he didn't go beyond the hallway. And secondly, how can you accuse someone like that without knowing them at all? Times are what they are. There are scammers everywhere. You can't trust anyone. Especially not strangers. You have to be on guard all the time. Do you really think he helped you out of the goodness of his heart? I don't think so. He's just trying to find out more about you to make his next move. You're at work all day, and Clark is at school for half the day. Plenty of time for him to break in. Ha! Hide your valuables just in case, and don't keep cash at home. Well, I don't know, Betty, Abigail pondered. Abigail, do you really think this person is capable of such things? I do. Why not? Last year, my aunt was robbed. They caught the thief, and guess who it was? A neighbor who also rented an apartment in her building. He didn't steal personally, but his friends did, on his instructions. My aunt isn't poor, she wears gold and has things worth taking. Well, I don't have anything worth stealing, Abigail replied. And I have no savings. I live paycheck to paycheck. I've saved a little for Clark's camp trip, but that's in my bank account. That's good. It's better on the card. All right, I'll call Rachel. Maybe I'm just being paranoid, but it's better to be safe. I'll let you know what I find out about him. But you be careful and tell your son not to open the door to anyone when he's home alone. Okay, Betty, thanks, Abigail said. She said goodbye to her neighbor and went home. Who knows, maybe Betty was right. There really are so many scammers around. Just because this person helped her carry the bags doesn't mean he's trustworthy. She couldn't know what he was really thinking. For some reason, Eric came to mind. Before the wedding, he seemed generous and kind, and he got along well with Clark. Then it was as if he had been replaced. It turned out he was not only incredibly stingy, but also capable of raising a hand against a child. So, it's very easy to misjudge someone. Abigail decided she would talk to her son and be more vigilant in the future. She remembered how she had let a complete stranger into her apartment. What if he had turned out to be different? Abigail thought. She was washing the dishes after dinner when someone rang the doorbell. The woman hurried to the hallway and looked through the peephole. Standing outside was the man from apartment 56, the unpleasant type, as Betty had described him. What does he want? Abigail wondered, feeling a little uneasy. Who is it? she asked, deciding not to open the door just yet. Let him say why he was there. Good evening. This is your neighbor. I'm sorry. Do you have a bandage or a plaster? And any antiseptic? I was cooking and cut my hand, but I don't have anything at home. I didn't manage to buy supplies before the pharmacy closed. After hesitating for a moment, Abigail opened the door. She was a nurse, and hearing that the man had injured his hand made it impossible for her to remain indifferent. At that moment, she didn't think about Betty's warning. The man needed help that she could provide. Abigail saw the neighbor's hand wrapped in a kitchen towel, which was already soaked in blood. How careless of you, Abigail exclaimed. Come in, let me take a look. She led the man to the kitchen, told him to sit on a stool, and got her first aid kit from the cupboard to treat the wound. Thank you, Abigail, the neighbor said as she applied a bandage. I don't even know how I managed that. 
I was cutting vegetables, and then. I had sharpened the knife right before. It happens, Abigail nodded sympathetically, then asked, but how do you know my name? We didn't introduce ourselves, and you don't remember me? No. Should I? Abigail looked at him closely, but his face didn't seem familiar. I remember you well and recognized you right away when we first ran into each other in the hallway. Your hairstyle is different, but you haven't changed much. Excuse me, where could we have seen each other? Abigail still didn't understand. At the hospital, ten years ago. Oh, yes, I worked at the hospital back then. Were you a patient there? I ended up there with a serious injury. It's no surprise you don't remember me. My whole face was bandaged. But I remembered you. Thankfully, my eyes weren't harmed. Later, when I was recovering, you disappeared, and I found out you no longer worked there. Abigail tensed, trying to recall. Wait, the injured young captain? Yes, Chuck nodded. When I saw you in the hallway, it was like a jolt of electricity went through me. I couldn't believe my eyes that you were the Abigail from the hospital. You know, I felt like I survived thanks to you. Oh, come on, Chuck, it wasn't me. Our doctor saved you, I was just a nurse. No, Abigail, I'm very grateful to the doctors for my life. But at that time, I didn't want to live at all. When I heard your voice and saw your smile, I realized that I needed to keep going, no matter what. I was so disappointed when I learned you no longer worked at the hospital. I was there for a long time, recovering, and then I wanted to find you, but your colleagues said you were married and expecting a child. Of course, I didn't want to intrude on your family, but I'm sure it was your kindness that saved me. At that moment, Clark walked into the kitchen and looked at Chuck in surprise. Son, this is our neighbor, Uncle Chuck. Abigail introduced him. He hurt his hand, and I helped him. Hello, little man. Hi, Chuck smiled. Your mom has saved me more than once. She must be my guardian angel. How is that? Clark asked, puzzled. Your mom will tell you, Chuck laughed. But I should go, I still need to make dinner. Thank you, Abigail. Chuck, would you like to have dinner? It'll be inconvenient for you to cook with a bandaged hand. Well, it would be inconvenient, but I feel a bit awkward taking advantage of your kindness. Come on. What's awkward about it? Besides, it turns out we've known each other for ten years. So why can't I treat an old friend to dinner? I must admit, I'm very hungry, Chuck smiled. That's great. Abigail got a plate and approached the stove. There was another knock at the door. Clark, see who it is, she called to her son. Mom, it's Aunt Betty, the boy replied. Let her in. Betty entered the kitchen with a serious expression. Abigail, I found out everything, she began, but suddenly froze in confusion when she saw Chuck eagerly enjoying the goulash. Hi, Betty. Want some tea? Abigail smiled. By the way, meet Chuck, my old acquaintance and our neighbor. And this is Betty, also our neighbor. Good evening, Chuck greeted Betty. So, an acquaintance? An old one, Betty remarked, a hint of displeasure in her voice as she observed the scene. Should I pour you some tea? Abigail offered again, noticing Betty's mood. Tea? Yes, I suppose I won't refuse, the woman replied, continuing to scrutinize Chuck. Thank you for the delicious dinner, said the man, getting up from the table, and thanks again for the medical help. I'll be going now, Abigail. I don't want to intrude on you. Okay, Chuck, nodded Abigail, pouring tea for her neighbor, and please be careful. Take care of yourself. 
I promise, replied Chuck. Once the man left, Betty immediately pounced on Abigail with questions. What does all this mean? Why didn't you tell me right away that he's your acquaintance? I'm here making all sorts of assumptions, trying to get to the bottom of it, and you're just keeping quiet. It seems like you wanted to tell me something too, Abigail replied calmly. No way. I want to hear you out first, Betty continued, getting worked up. All right. I used to work at a hospital before Clark was born, and we had a young captain brought in with a serious injury. The doctors literally pulled him back from the brink. He underwent several surgeries, and I took care of him. So, that's our neighbor Chuck. Why didn't you tell me this right away? I'm going crazy thinking there's a suspicious guy living in our building, and you know him. Betty, don't be mad. I didn't recognize him at first. He was all bandaged up in the hospital, his face was covered, and I, of course, treated his wound since I'm a medic. It turned out he remembered me and called me by name. We started talking, and that's when I recalled him. Wow. Betty was amazed by what she heard. Just like in the movies. I'm still in shock. It was very unexpected. What did you want to tell me? What did Rachel say to you? That's not so important now. In short, I got in touch with the landlord. She assured me that he's not a criminal but a former soldier. He recently divorced his wife, left the apartment for her and their daughter, and decided to rent a place for himself. That's pretty much it. See, Abigail smiled. You were wrong to suspect him of all sorts of things. You worked yourself and me up for nothing. Yeah, maybe, Betty said uncertainly, but he still doesn't sit right with me. He's unpleasant. Why is he unpleasant? Abigail countered. He's quite a handsome man, and his scars don't really detract from that, especially when you know how he got them. Chuck risked his life to save his comrades. That's what the doctors told me back then. So you could say he's a hero, and you were ready to label him a criminal without finding out the truth. You can't do that. Look at you, all melted. You're already feeding him dinner, Betty continued, seemingly unimpressed by Abigail's words about Chuck's brave act. Yes, I fed him, and what's the big deal? The man injured his hand and didn't have time to prepare food. So I offered him dinner. I don't mind feeding a good person, especially since it turns out we know each other. Well, well, a good person, Betty said, her lips curling slightly. It seems he's divorced and doesn't have a place of his own, and here's this great opportunity, a lonely woman with an apartment. What are you hinting at, Betty? I'm not hinting, Abigail. I'm saying it outright, Betty continued in the same vein. He's probably already spun some yarn for you, like how you captured his heart back in the hospital. Did he say something like that? Well, maybe, Abigail replied. Aha. And you probably believed him and started welcoming him right away. You're too trusting. You can easily be deceived. Abigail felt uncomfortable listening to Betty. Why did she only see negativity? If someone has scars on their face, does that mean they got them in some criminal fight? If he said kind words, did it have to be with some hidden agenda? Meanwhile, Betty continued lecturing her neighbor. Abigail, I understand. You're lonely, you want to arrange your personal life, and your son is growing up without a father. But you need to be more careful. Chuck is definitely going to start making advances towards you. Not because he's in love, but because he's interested in your living space. Rent can be expensive, and he must be paying alimony. And here's a perfect option. So, you think I can't attract a man on my own? Abigail replied indignantly. No, not at all. Betty exclaimed. 
that's not what I meant. It's just that Chuck seems really suspicious, you know? I just want to warn you against making a mistake. Admit it, it's unpleasant to be used. Besides, why do you need this wounded soldier who pays alimony? If you're going to arrange your personal life, it should be with someone more deserving. Betty, I appreciate your concern, but let me handle my personal life and check on my own. Abigail couldn't hold back. And if anything, I'm not looking to get married again. I've had enough of Eric. Clark and I don't need anyone else. Well, as you wish, Betty said discontentedly, getting up from the table. Don't say I didn't warn you later. Thanks for the tea. I'll be going. No need to see me off. Left alone, Abigail pondered. Why did Betty think Chuck would start making advances toward her? What happened ten years ago had nothing to do with the present. Of course, she enjoyed what Chuck said today. She hadn't realized that the severely injured captain had any interest in her. But so much time had passed. Chuck, it turned out, was married, which meant his feelings for her belonged to the past. Did those feelings even exist? Most likely, he had imagined them while teetering between life and death. Today, they met and talked like old friends. Abigail was genuinely glad Chuck survived and was doing well. Not everything was perfect, of course, since he was divorced, but the main thing was that he was alive. She vividly remembered the doctors fighting for Chuck's life back then. His chances of survival and full recovery weren't very high. Betty is strange, Abigail thought. At first, she conjured up all sorts of horrors about the new neighbor, and now that it turns out Chuck isn't a criminal, she immediately casts him as a marriage scammer or someone looking for a place to stay. And this is despite the fact that there is no talk of any relationship. It seemed like Betty had nothing better to do than meddle in others' lives. She should find a job or have a child, then she wouldn't have time to concern herself with other people's affairs. Abigail's thoughts were interrupted by Clark. Mom, who is a guardian angel, and why did Uncle Chuck say that to you? The boy asked, sitting beside her. She answered his questions as best as she could. You saved Uncle Chuck's life. No, the doctor saved his life. I just helped the doctors. I wish my dad had a guardian angel, Clark sighed. Tell me more about Dad. I don't remember him at all. Everyone has a guardian angel, sweetheart, but each person has their time on this earth. We can't change that. But I believe your dad is watching over us and protecting us. So he's my guardian angel now? Yes, sweetheart. Your dad loved you very much and was waiting for you. Abigail hugged her son and began to tell him about his father, struggling to hold back tears. Bright yet bittersweet memories of him enveloped her. Sunday arrived. The autumn day was sunny and warm, and Abigail and Clark went to the movies. Mother and son loved spending time together and often treated themselves to little celebrations. they go to the movies or the circus and then definitely head to a cafe for pizza, ice cream, and other treats. Abigail was delighted that she and her son had such a close bond. The boy trusted her and shared all his childhood problems. They were very happy together. Abigail knew that she and Clark were a family. A small one, but still a family, the closest people to each other. As Clark and his mother exited the theater, discussing the animated movie they had just seen, they unexpectedly ran into Chuck. He wasn't alone. Standing next to him was a little girl who looked around seven years old and bore a striking resemblance to him. Abigail immediately realized that this must be his daughter. It turned out that Chuck and his daughter had come to the same screening. What a coincidence! The man exclaimed happily. Let me introduce you. This is my daughter, Lily. 
Lily, these are my neighbors, Aunt Abigail and Clark. Aunt Abigail is a nurse. She took care of me in the hospital. She's my savior. I'll tell you all about it later. Hello. The fair-haired girl greeted in a tiny voice. The name Lily suited her wonderfully, as she looked like a delicate, elegant flower. Hello, Lily. Abigail smiled. It's very nice to meet you. Hi, said Clark, looking at the girl with interest. Did you like the movie? Yes, Lily replied shyly, a faint blush rising on her cheeks. How's your hand, Chuck? Abigail asked. It's fine. Everything is great, the man replied, showing his injured hand. It's healing very quickly. You have a gentle touch, Abigail, and you're an incredibly kind person. Thank you for the kind words, but we're too unfamiliar for such conclusions, she said. Now that we're neighbors, I hope we can get to know each other better. For some reason, Abigail couldn't shake the image of Betty's disapproving face, warning her about Chuck's ulterior motives. She shook her head, trying to dispel the thought. Betty really knows how to cloud someone's judgment. She resolved to interact with her less often. After all, there was no talk of a romance, and she didn't need that. However, being friends was certainly possible, especially with such a charming daughter, who now had Clark completely captivated. Are you coming with us to the cafe? The boy asked, clearly eager to continue getting to know Lily. Shall we go? Chuck asked, glancing at his daughter. The girl nodded, once again blushing a soft pink. The street cafe was crowded, which wasn't surprising given it was a weekend and the lovely September weather. But their cheerful group managed to find an empty table where they settled in and immediately began to study the menu. I'm so hungry. Chuck said, choosing a portion of shish kebab and a Caesar salad. Abigail ordered fish with vegetables, while the kids chose fries and nuggets. Oh, you love all these unhealthy foods. Abigail sighed. Sometimes it's okay. They don't eat like this every day. Chuck supported the kids' choices. Yeah, Mom, not every day, Clark declared seriously, exchanging smiles with Chuck. Well, if it's only sometimes, Abigail agreed. For dessert, everyone ordered ice cream, and while waiting for their orders, they decided to come up with riddles on the spot. Time flew by quickly and happily. Lily finally stopped being shy and accepted Clark's invitation to play on the nearby playground. While the kids played, Chuck and Abigail had a chance to talk. Maybe we should switch to you? Chuck suggested. Our kids have become friends. Sure, Abigail readily agreed and immediately added, You have a lovely daughter, Chuck. I also dreamed of having a daughter. I always wanted a boy and a girl, but fate decided otherwise, and I only have Clark. Abigail, I know you live alone. What happened to your husband? Chuck asked. Sorry, you can skip the question if it's too personal. My husband died when Clark was two. He was an officer, just like you, a real man. By the way, I also met him in the hospital. I'm so sorry. Have you not remarried since then? I did, but it was a disaster. He turned out to be completely wrong for me. I don't even know why I accepted his proposal. I guess I wanted a complete family for Clark, someone to be his father. We didn't even last six months. He tried to raise my son into a real man with a belt. Chuck exclaimed angrily. He would hit him while raising his hand against a child. That's something I couldn't forgive either. After that, I decided that it was just going to be Clark and me. At least I would be sure that no one would hurt my son in my absence. Clark was so quiet about it, like a partisan, he never told me what was happening to him. 
Luckily, Yana returned and saw everything for herself. All right, Chuck, I don't want to dwell on that. Let's change the subject. Tell me about yourself now. I've also been married twice, Chuck began. It turns out we have quite a bit in common. I met my first wife while I was still a cadet. The love we had was such that we couldn't live without each other. We got married and lived together for a few years. It seemed to go well. Kids? Only Ira didn't want any, always dragging her feet about it, saying it wasn't the right time. Then I was sent on a business trip where I got the injury that I miraculously survived. A few days before that, I spoke with Stella on the phone, and she told me she was filing for divorce. She found someone else and said she was tired of my service, tired of waiting for me to return from dangerous missions, worrying about me. She wanted a peaceful life, security, stability. With me, she said, it was like living on a powder keg. That's why I didn't want to live when I came to in the hospital after the injury. The pain was so intense, and physical pain is nothing compared to the agony of the soul. I understand, Abigail said, listening intently. I felt the same way after Derek's death. The pain in my soul was so overwhelming that I thought I would die from it. I was only able to pull myself together and find the strength to go on for Clark's sake. And you brought me back to life. I've told you before, I saw your kind smile, heard your voice. It made me want to live again. I looked forward to your shifts, waiting to see you. Chuck looked at Abigail intently, and she remembered that gaze. Back then, ten years ago, the wounded and bandaged young captain looked at her the same way. She hadn't known what he looked like, but she had seen his eyes, sad, full of pain, yet warm. What incredible surprises life sometimes holds for us. When Abigail left the hospital, she didn't know if the captain would survive. Ten years had passed, and here he was, sitting before her, alive, healthy, looking at her as only someone dear can. Is your second wife Lily's mother? Abigail asked. Yes, Grace, Lily's mom. I'm very grateful to her for my daughter. Lily means everything to me. I never thought I could love someone this much. I just can't get enough of my daughter. Why did you divorce Grace? It seems it's written in my fate that all my women will leave me, Chuck said with a sad smile. Grace also found someone else, but our breakup was amicable. Maybe because I didn't have such strong feelings for her as I did for Stella. That's painful. We've maintained a good relationship for Lily's sake. Grace doesn't interfere with my time with her, which I'm very grateful for. I left the apartment to Lily and am renting for now. That's my gloomy situation. But I'm not complaining. I'm glad I survived back then, glad I have Lily, and glad I met you again. And for some reason, I feel like our meeting wasn't by chance. Abigail didn't have a chance to respond because at that moment, the kids came running. They were holding hands and looked very happy. Chuck and Abigail exchanged glances. They were both pleased that their children had become friends so quickly. Can we all go somewhere together again next weekend? Clark asked, letting go of Lily's small hand. Of course. Chuck and Abigail replied in unison. Abigail returned home in great spirits. After the cafe... Chuck took Lily home, and as they said goodbye, they agreed to go out together again the following Sunday. Clark was also impressed by the wonderful day and meeting Lily. It would be great if Lily lived with her dad, the boy said dreamily. We could see each other often and go to school together. I could help Lily with her homework. I'm already in third grade, and she's in first. Lily has a mom and she lives with her, but Uncle Chuck promised that we could spend time together often. I like Uncle Chuck, the boy said thoughtfully. Abigail slightly flinched at his words. It was such an unexpected statement. 
She remembered how, after breaking up with Eric, she had a serious conversation with little Clark. At that time, she had apologized to her son for not knowing that someone was raising a hand against him, and she promised that there would be no more outsiders in their lives. She often criticized herself for that unfortunate marriage, which brought her nothing but deep disappointment and nearly harmed her child's health. And now Clark was talking about wanting a dad like Chuck. Clark, Abigail said, looking closely at her son, Uncle Chuck and I are just friends. But I'm glad you like him. He's a good man and also an officer, just like your dad. Uncle Chuck did a heroic thing by risking his life to save his comrades. Really? exclaimed the boy. Wow. He's a real hero, added Clark. Yes, sweetheart, Abigail smiled. Not everyone can risk their life for others. That's a very brave act. All week, Clark eagerly awaited Sunday. Abigail did too. She and Chuck had run into each other a few times in the hallway or near the house, exchanging a few phrases. One day, during such a meeting, while Chuck and Abigail were talking near the entrance, Betty walked past them. She cast an unhappy glance first at Chuck, then at Abigail, nodded quickly, and disappeared into the building. It seems our neighbor isn't in a good mood, Chuck noted. It seems so. Abigail agreed, well aware of the reason for Betty's bad mood. She clearly disapproved of Abigail's interactions with that unpleasant guy from apartment 56. Since the day Abigail asked Betty to let her sort out her own life and acquaintances, the neighbor had greeted her with a tight smile and avoided conversation. However, Abigail was glad about it. Betty's empty chatter had always worn her out. She didn't want to waste her time on unnecessary conversations with overly suspicious Betty. Abigail had so little free time after work, she rushed home to prepare dinner and help her son with his homework. Meanwhile, the unemployed and childless Betty often didn't know what to do with herself from boredom and sometimes just annoyed Abigail by imposing her company. So, Betty's silence didn't bother Abigail at all. I know she thinks I'm a very suspicious character, Chuck smiled. That's true. How did you guess? Abigail was surprised. Rachel, who I rent from, is an old acquaintance of mine. I served with her husband. So, Betty called her about me and claimed that Rachel had moved a criminal into the apartment and now the whole building had to worry about their property. Can you imagine? Yes, I can. That's totally in Betty's style. She tried to warn me about you and turn me against you and didn't stop even after she warned me to stay away from you. Because, in her opinion, you could easily be a marriage scammer. Chuck laughed. What a vivid imagination that woman has. She should write detective stories. I can understand her thinking I'm a criminal. She probably was put off by the scars on my face. But why I'm suddenly a marriage scammer? According to her, you'll start courting me to take over my apartment. Wow. What nonsense she's spouting. I hope you don't believe that. Of course not. Besides, we're just friends. But what if I did start to court you? Chuck asked unexpectedly. Do I have a chance? I promise I won't lay claim to your apartment. Chuck, I'm not ready to answer that question yet, Abigail admitted honestly. I really like you, but only as a friend for now. I understand, Abigail, and I won't pressure you. What about Sunday? Is everything still on? Of course. Clark can't wait. He's been buzzing in my ear about Lily. Lily liked Clark, too. On the long-awaited Sunday, it started pouring rain early in the morning. An upset Clark stared out the window, nearly in tears from disappointment. Are we really not going anywhere today? Yes, 
The weather let us down, Abigail sighed, equally upset. Then an idea popped into her head. How about we invite Lily and Uncle Chuck over to our place? Really? The boy perked up. Why not? I'll make something tasty, bake a pie. We can all play together. You have plenty of board games. Awesome, Mom. Thank you. I'll go down to Uncle Chuck and suggest it. Since the weather messed up our plans, Chuck was thrilled with Abigail's suggestion. It turned out that Lily was staying over at his place. He had picked her up from her mother's on Saturday because Grace was feeling unwell and asked Chuck to spend time with her daughter. In two hours, Abigail and Clark were welcoming their guests. And here's my signature dessert. Abigail said, pulling a golden pie out of the oven. The children clapped their hands joyfully, anticipating a delicious tea time. Just as Abigail was pouring the tea, there was a knock at the door. Are we expecting someone? Chuck asked. No, Abigail shrugged. I'll go see who it is. Hi, Abigail. I came to make peace. I said too much last time, said Betty as Abigail opened the door. I brought some candy for tea. And I could smell something baking. I thought it must be coming from your apartment. Abigail didn't know how to respond. It seemed impolite not to invite her, but at the same time, her visit was very inconvenient. Are you alone? Betty asked, noticing Abigail's hesitation. At that moment, they heard Chuck's voice and the children's laughter. Yes, I have guests, Abigail replied. I see things are getting serious with you, Betty observed as Clark and Lily ran into the hallway. They greeted the neighbor and dashed off to the room. Oh, Betty said, looks like a family idol here. You're quick to bring your daughter over. Sorry, but let's have tea another time, okay? Yes, I see I came at a bad time. All right, I'll go and not disturb you. Closing the door behind the neighbor, Abigail returned to the kitchen. Betty stopped by, she said to Chuck. She wanted to have some tea. She was feeling bored. Why didn't you invite her? Or did she not want to sit at the same table with a criminal and a marriage scammer? Chuck smiled. I thought she'd be out of place. You weren't wrong. She would have been. Kids, come and have some tea. Abigail called out, quickly forgetting about the annoying neighbor's visit. Time passed. Harsh snowy winter replaced autumn, giving way to warm spring, and soon it was sunny summer. Everything unfolded as it should. Abigail and Chuck spent a lot of time together. They grew close and eventually realized they couldn't imagine their lives without each other. Chuck understood this much earlier, almost immediately after he saw Abigail and recognized her, the very nurse who had come back to him. As time went on, Abigail was scared of making a mistake. She didn't want to be disappointed and initially tried to fight her feelings, convincing herself that Chuck was just a friend. But eventually, time put everything in its place, and a year after they began to communicate, Chuck and Abigail decided they were ready to become a family. You know, I never forgot you, Chuck said, embracing Abigail. You always lived in my heart and visited my dreams. I felt that our paths would cross again someday. I just knew it. Abigail didn't reply. She rested her head on Chuck's strong shoulder, silently thanking fate for bringing their paths together. We'll share this life together. We now have one road, she said, feeling their hearts beat in unison. They merged into one slowly. She grew in him, and he in her, with a mysterious, unexplainable force. They were destined to be together, as if they had fallen from the heavens or burned in fire. Sweetheart, thank you for being with me. Until we meet again.